One moment. Microphone. Mike? Oh, there we go. All right. Thank you all for having me. This is a, a very exciting day. Uh, I don't think I'm going to hold a candle to Mr. Kentrill, uh, but I'll try. Uh, so I'm here to talk about uh, containers, Kubernetes, uh, and the way Google approaches these things. A little bit of background. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, because I assume you all know what containers are. You're here. Um, Google has been doing containers for a very long time, 10 years plus, 2004-ish uh, is when we started. Um, back in 2004, a Linux container means a cheroot, right? That's it. It's a cheroot. Um, over time, we evolved the capabilities of containers. It became a cheroot and some pneuma messing. Uh, then it became C groups when C groups basically uh, got adopted, thanks to some of the engineers, early engineers on Google's Borg system. Over the course of those 10 years, we have evolved our understanding of how we deal with containers, what it means to run containers, to the point that everything at Google runs in containers. Everything. Um, Gmail runs in containers. Web search, maps, all run in containers. All of our batch work, map reduces, runs in containers. Uh, our storage systems, GFS, Colossus, runs in containers. Even GCE, our, our cloud offering, the VMs, they run inside containers. We throw this number around because it's a good big number. We launch every week 2 billion containers. Billion with a B. So you're all here because you're interested in containers. You like containers. Containers, they're, they're changing everything, right? But it's so different. Everything you need to deal with with containers is different than what you've been dealing with before. How you deploy a container how you manage containers, how you monitor containers, um, how you do isolation. Man, isolation, I could talk, I have talked for hours on end about isolation. I was just having some interesting discussions before this about some of the problems that we face with isolation um, that we are all going to face. You don't know you have these problems, but you do. Um, how you update applications, how you do discovery. We've seen a couple of interesting uh, ways that people are doing things like service discovery. Um, how you manage scale and replication and how you think in terms of sets and uh, instead of single points of failure, you have these replicated things. Everything is different. It's a fundamentally different way of managing stuff and it requires new ways of managing it. It requires new tools, it requires new abstractions, and it requires you to think about things differently. So. I bring you Kubernetes. Has anybody not heard of Kubernetes outside of today? Because we've been mentioned a, f a few times. Awesome. Um, I'm excited about that, because six months ago, that was not the case. Um, Kubernetes is what the world has come to call a container orchestrator. Um, we run and we manage containers. For the purpose of this conversation, you can read containers as Docker containers, but I'll talk more about that later. Um, we do support multiple cloud environments. We run in Amazon, Microsoft, Google, Rackspace, DigitalOcean. We also support bare metal. We support OpenStack. Um, and we, we are possible to install in sort of whatever situation you're in. Um, so if you're thinking about Kubernetes, but you're not sure if it can be made to work for you in your situation, come and talk to me, because I bet it can. Um, Kubernetes as a system is inspired by and informed by Google's experience building these systems. Um, if for anybody who wants to read the background, we published a paper um, a year or two ago called Omega. Uh, and we've now, as of this week, published a paper on our Borg system. Um, so you can go read lots of gory details about how the Borg system works. Kubernetes is inspired by those systems. It is not open source versions of those systems. It is not the same in a lot of ways. We've made very different design decisions. Um, for example, the things that made sense in Borg 10 years ago were perfectly correct design decisions then, but they're wrong now. Right? The world has changed since then, so we've made some different decisions. Kubernetes is 100% open source. We work in the open. Um, it's written in Go, for those of you who like Go. It's a great language that fits in this really neat niche between C++ and Java. Um, the main point here, you focus on applications, you don't focus on the machines. Applications are what matter. Luke talked about pets and cattle, so I'm just going to put this up here uh, because I thought they were cute pictures. We like cattle. Pets are okay. We're not against pets, but really the direction people, thinks people should be moving their things is towards cattle. <clears throat> so I'm going to give you a 50,000-foot view of our system. I'm going to intentionally get some of the details wrong just to make the conversation easier, um, and we can come back later and correct some of the details. <clears throat> 
From 50,000 feet, the system looks like this. You have users, they use various inputs, they talk to a master, the master makes some decisions, and it does stuff with our nodes. Um, for people who've been following Kubernetes, we used to call nodes minions, now we call them nodes. Um, this, is, this is it. This is not a very useful diagram, though, so let's walk through it. As a user, you say something like, run X. I want you to run this container called X. I want two copies of it, and I want you to use four gigs of memory, and I want you to have two and a half CPUs. Right? And you submit this to your API server. The API server says, sure, I can do that. And here's your, here's your UID. It's a cookie that you can come back and look things up later. Now the API server has to stop. What nodes am I going to put this on? This is scheduling, right? And, and Andrea and some of the others have talked about the scheduling problem. Um, like these other systems, we have things like constraints, we have things like affinity, we have things like resource mapping. Um, the scheduler chews on all of these decisions and figures out what system, what, what nodes should I put this, this job on? And eventually it makes a decision and it says, well, you asked for two copies, so I'm going to go off and run two copies, and I'm going to put them on these two nodes. These two nodes now, we mentioned Docker, they're going to go off and do a Docker pull, they're going to get the image down from the registry, and voila, they're running this, they're running X, right? This takes about as long as it takes to do a Docker pull. For the most part, the system works very quickly. Now these, the, the individual machines, they're going to report information. They're going to say, well, here's the status, right? The API server now has status. As a user, you can come along and say, hey, what happened to X? I asked you to run X, right? And you get back your status of X. Pretty straightforward. But the interesting part, oh, did I miss a slide? Oh, yes. All you really care about, I talked to a master, it talked to the container cluster, and it gave me back some information. As a user, you should not care at all about the nodes that you're running on. You should not care about what OS they're running. You should not care about what, what kernel version they're running. Put a big asterisk on that. Um, you should not care about where they're located. You should not care about what the hardware is in them. Again, with a big asterisk on it. Um, for the most part, all you care about is, I asked you to run a job, and you ran my job. So. I threw the word container cluster out. A container cluster is, is really, there's two parts of a container cluster. Part one, setting up a cluster. This is, uh, this is the hard part, frankly. Um, and unfortunately, this is the part that most people run into first when they look at a system like Kubernetes, um, because there are things you have to do just to make it work. Um, you have to choose what cloud provider you're going to run in. You have to choose what kind of node you're going to run on, which OS. You've got to provision those nodes. You've got to get the networking set up correctly. This is a big deal for Kubernetes, networking. Um, you've got to start your cluster services. You can't really run your Kubernetes system without things like DNS. And then you've got to go out and manage those nodes. You've got to do kernel upgrades. You've got to do OS hard updates. You've got to manage hardware failures. Your disks go bad all the time. Um, this is not the fun part, but it's sort of unavoidable. Um, these other talks today, they have the same problems. They just, you know, it's e sometimes it's easier and sometimes it's harder, but they have the same problems, right? With your Docker Swarm, if your machine goes bad, you've got to deal with it, right? So you can't get away from this. This is where things like Google Container Engine really help. This is the, the promise of things like Container Engine are let us manage your cluster, right? Don't worry about setup, don't worry about management. You instead get to focus on part two. Part two is using a cluster. This is the good part. This is where it gets fun. You go off and make your applications, and you make your applications faster and you make them easier with systems like this. Docker, containers, Everybody has experienced these, about how, how much nicer it is to build and deploy with these things. So you go off and you run your containers, and you run your replication, and you set up the abstract services, and you use your volumes, and you share your data, and you serve, right? This is the fun part. This is where the real promise of, of, of orchestration systems lies. But it's important, this is a distinct problem from cluster management. The same people who run your cluster do not need to be the same people who manage your applications. For example, at Google, all of our clusters are run by a few dozen core Borg SREs. All of our applications are run by a few hundred app, app SREs. The app SREs, they know how Gmail works, and they know where the choke points are, and they know where it's going to fail, and they know how to manage it. And the Borg SREs, they know when the machines fail, and they know how the clusters are going to scale, and they have some knowledge of each other, but they're different teams. And what means you can hire experts in these different areas and you can focus, right? Your application people, they focus on their applications. 
don't make your developers deal with machine administration. Right? It's a different problem, it's a different mindset, and it requires different expertise. So I mentioned networking. So networking is a fun problem with, with Kubernetes. We've taken a slightly different attack on networking from a lot of other systems. Um, so to understand it, it's worth looking a little bit at Docker, right? Um, the default Docker networking mode, um, and I agree with the earlier presenters who said, this is not really Docker's fault. This is part of the LXC networking model of containers. Um, but the standard in Docker is you spin up containers on different machines, and they can't talk to each other. By default, they just don't know about each other. And so the way you talk to each other is you go through host ports, which is all network address translation and proxying. And there's a performance cost to this, but there's a complexity cost too, right? Suddenly, you don't know what port your friends are, are working or serving on. You have to go look them up. You've got to do service discovery. It makes the whole ecosystem more complicated. So for Kubernetes, at the very beginning of this project, about a year ago, we said, let's, let's put down a ground rule, right? No port brokering. We do this inside systems like Borg and Omega too, and it's got enormous complexity. So let's just try not to do it. Let's, let's see if we can do this system without port brokering. So we set the rule. All, pod, or all container IPs are routable. I'll talk about pods in a minute. Um, by default, Docker is private, uh, but there are ways of doing this with Docker. Um, by default, all containers can reach each other without network translation. Right? This is the fundamental requirement of the Kubernetes networking. Um, to achieve this, you either are running in a really dumb environment or a really smart environment. Um, the really dumb environments, well, ARP mostly satisfies this. Um, in the really smart environments, you have SDNs, you have OVS, you have Weave, you have um, Calico, you have um, uh, Flannel. How could I forget Flannel? Um, you have all these SDN systems that overlay on top of your network and let you satisfy this constraint. This simplifies the system so much that if you're using Docker and you're not looking at something like Flannel or one of these other systems, go home and look up these systems and see how they make your life easier. So now in the Kubernetes world, all of these containers can just talk to each other. There's no magic, there's no host ports, there's no uh, brokering, there's no figuring out where you are, it just works. You wanna run your MySQL container on port 30, whatever it is, uh, you can go do that. You wanna run on port 80? Hey, you can all use port 80, that's cool. Go right ahead. <clears throat> so I've slipped and mentioned pods a couple times. Um, pods is a concept that we've introduced in Kubernetes. Um, it's like containers, except it's multiple containers. Um, you remember the, the very beginning of Docker when the first thing you did was you took everything running in your VM and you ran it inside one container, right? You took a container and you said Ubuntu and then you started Apache and started Systemd and started you know, all these different things. They were all running in one container and then you wanted to upgrade one piece of that and how much it hurt, right? So Docker has moved to a model where they really advocate one container, one process, right? One container, one service. We believe very much in that model, um, but sometimes you have to ship things together. Sometimes you really have these containers that, are co that need to be co-located, that are very tightly coupled, um, and you need a way to express that, right? Docker has links, which is a great way of expressing the, uh, the implementation of it, but it's not a way of expressing the config of it, not the intent. Um, so we have this thing called, we call a pod, like a pod of peas or a pod of whales. Um, Containers in a pod are tightly coupled. Um, they are our atom. They are the thing that we schedule. Now, a lot of containers can be a pod of one, and that's okay. Um, but when you need the ability to, to have a second thing in your pod, it's, excuse me, it's very powerful that you have it. For example, <coughs> The canonical example we use here is a file puller, right? You have something that syncs down from your content management server. Maybe it does a git sync uh, over and over again. Um, it writes files into a shared volume, and then you have a, a web server that serves that traffic, right? Or you have a little ad administrative console application that manages another, another piece of your system. These things, in a pod, they share a network namespace, so they see each other as local host. It's just like they're running in a VM, except you can rev them independently of each other. Um, they share an inter-process communication namespace, so they can use semaphores and they can use shared memory, all that good old stuff that predates microservices. Um, you can use those things. Your applications will just work. Um, pods are mortal, though. Like, they're born and they die and they're never resurrected. Um, 
This is a part of the Kubernetes scheduling model. Uh, what it really means is uh, it has some, in, some impact in the overall design and how you think about your applications. I don't have time to go into all of that today, but I'm happy to answer questions if people want to talk more about it. Um, so I wanted to talk, I was trying to figure out like, what do I want to dig in, in depth on here. So I picked a couple of topics that I thought were interesting stuff about Kubernetes, and I'm going to go into a little bit of details um, right up until they kick me off the stage. Uh, and then anybody who has questions can come and talk to me. So we've got this concept we call services. Services is service as in service discovery or microservice, um, but I didn't feel like typing five extra characters every time, so it's a service. Um, it's a group of pods that work together. Today, we have a couple of different policies. We have something called a, a headless pod, which is basically um, a set of pods that work together and you know, have like a DNS uh, multi-record multi response for a DNS name. Um, and then we have something we call a, a load balanced pod. The load balanced, uh, sorry, load balanced service. The serv load balancing is where it gets interesting. When you, act, when you create a service in our Kubernetes API, uh, you get a virtual IP address. This virtual IP address exists within the cluster, and all machines within the cluster know how to access this virtual IP address. This virtual IP, which we call the portal, um, becomes the way that your clients can access your, your backends without knowing how many backends there are. It's a load balancer, right? But it's a distributed load balancer. So let's look at some of the details. Um, we've got our API server, it's our master, right? And we've got this thing that runs on every machine called the cube proxy. And it just installs a watch and it says, hey, tell me whenever there's a new service or a new endpoint object. Now you have a user that comes along and says, hey, I would like to create some pods. So he goes off and he creates some pods. Uh, the API server says, sure, I'll go run on those pods. Now we've got three pods running in our cluster. Now the user comes along and says, I'd like to create a service. Note here, that we say the selector uh, is app nifty. So any pods that have the label app equals nifty will be satisfied by the service. If you look back at our pod definition, it does have that label. So this service is going to select all three of those pods. That means all three of those pods are, are eligible backends for this service. We create the portal IP at 10987, uh, and we set it up with port 80, right? So now when that's done, our cube proxy gets an alert on that watch and says, hey, there's a new service. So it goes off and it opens a port on localhost and it says, this is the port for which I will proxy this service. Then it goes out to IP tables and it says, hey, IP tables, if you see any traffic to 10987 on port 80, send it to me. I, I'm going to handle it. And so then the API server says, oh, now there's new endpoints. That service has now been resolved into a set of pods, which is this, this constituency. So now we've got the system basically set up. The client comes along and says, hey, I need to access this service. 10987, port 80, here I come. It sends a packet. The kernel says, uh-oh, I know that packet. I'm going to redirect you over to the cube proxy, right? This is all completely transparent to your client. Your client never sees this. The cube proxy then says, well, okay, I've got some policies around uh, client IP-based affinity and around you know, round-robin policies. I'm going to choose a backend for you, and it then becomes your proxy. Right? This is similar to some of the other ideas that were put out earlier. Um, I think the key difference here is the virtual IP part of it, um, which has its pros and its cons. Um, so the net result here is your client is talking to this virtual IP address, but it's actually choosing one of your backends. If this backend goes away, we will detect it, we'll remove it from the constituency, and you'll just choose a different backend, right? This is sort of a classic load balancer, but you don't have to run the load balancer. It all exists virtually within your cluster. How am I for time? So, um, Quickly, the concept of, of volumes. Volumes in Kubernetes are very similar to Docker volumes. In fact, they're built on top of Docker volumes. Um, because we have a pod, and a pod has a lifetime that's distinct from any one container, we say that the, the volumes have a lifetime that's bound to the pod. Um, we have a lot of different pod, uh, sorry, uh, volume plugins now. So we've, we've implemented as a pluginable system. Um, in the last three weeks, we've seen the number of volume plugins go from four to about 15. Um, these include things like NFS, iSCSI, uh, Amazon Block Store, um, Gluster. We're working on Ceph. Uh, there's a, f a change request in flight for Cinder, which is uh, OpenStack. Um, so basically, if you can model, and in fact, Luke is going to send us a Flocker plugin any day now. Um, if you can model your storage system as a directory, a mounted directory with some stuff in it, you can be a Kubernetes volume plugin. Um, 
So now we've got this idea on top of plugins that are called, uh, on top of volumes, called persistent volumes. What persistent volumes let you do is, as an administrator, go out and say, well, I'm going to allow this cluster to have um, some number of Amazon EBS volumes. These things cost money, so I'm going to put a limit on them and how big they can be. But if a user asks for an EBS volume, or they ask for a, a volume of a particular size, you can satisfy that with an EBS volume, right? So then as a user, I say, gosh, I need, a, I need a persistent storage volume of 50 gigs. The system will then say, well, you can satisfy this with an EBS. It will create you an EBS. It will satisfy it. You've now got a claim ticket. This claim is yours. Until you release it, you have it. So this is your pet storage, right? Sometimes pets are appropriate. Um, now I can go out and I can mount that that volume that I have the claim ticket for in any pod that I want to. I can run my database in it, and then I can unmount my database, and I can run my recovery system in it, and I can unmount that, and I can run my backup system, and I can unmount that. Um, and it's mine until I release it. When I release it, the system will then recycle it, possibly return it to Amazon, depending on how it's actually been implemented. This is new. This is in flight right now. So I mentioned earlier uh, Docker. Um, right now, we support Docker exclusively. But there's nothing actually intrinsic about our system that makes it coupled completely to Docker. So we're working on sort of elevating the abstraction one step to, the, to a runtime, where you could run things like Rocket. People are talking about running things like LXC. Um, I would love to see us run our own container stuff underneath this. Um, the idea here is that most of our system doesn't really care that it's Docker which is good. This is good for the users because now you can use whatever technology actually makes sense for you, whether it's Docker, whether it's Docker from a public registry, from a private registry, whether it's Rocket using their DNS federated stuff, whether it's your own custom container technology, you can actually implement plugins. I love plugins. You can implement your own plugin for your own runtime system and it will just work. So I'm running out of time, so I, throw out, I would throw out a bunch of other things that are going on in Kubernetes space. And if people are interested in any of these topics, I'm going to be around. Please come talk to me. Find us on GitHub, IRC, whatever. Um, we have network plugins. We're working on a secrets API for authentication. We're working on graceful termination and notifications there. We have quota. We have more volume types in flight. We have new downwards facing APIs so applications can learn more about how they've been run. Um, more platform support. Performance, we're, performance is going up and up and up. We have our goals for 1.0 performance. We're already pretty much meeting those goals. We're looking at how do we grow beyond that. Seems pretty straightforward. Scalability, high availability, better scheduling, cluster federation, being able to take two clusters and two different clouds and have them work with each other. Uh, streamlining setup, uh, the whole you know batteries included sorts of stuff. Uh, these are all things that we're working on right now. So some quick uh, status. Um, Kubernetes was open sourced uh, almost a year ago. Uh, in 2014, we won the Black Duck uh, Rookie, of the War Rookie of the Year Award. Uh, we're in good company. Docker also won that award a couple years before. Um, this year, we launched Container Engine, which is hosted Kubernetes. Don't worry about the setup. We'll deal with it for you. Uh, Red Hat is working on their OpenShift 3, which is a PaaS built on top of Kubernetes. Uh, CoreOS has just announced Tectonic, which is all prepackaged Kubernetes on CoreOS. Um, Mirantis has announced Murano, which is an OpenStack plugin using Kubernetes. Uh, so adoption is great. I'm super excited about all this. Um, we are driving towards a 1.0 release in, in a few months. Uh, we think it'll be this summer. Uh, we'll, you know, we'll do it when it's ready, but we think it'll be ready this summer. Uh, we have a roadmap. Roadmap is public. You can go take a look and see what's in there. The big goal. A lot of people ask me, like, why does Google care? Why are you here? Um, Google has a cloud, right? And like, I'll be frank, our cloud is not the number one in the market yet. yet. Um, and we really believe, we really deeply to, our, to the core of our DNA believe containers are going to change things. Containers are, are what we do. This is what we speak. Um, so if we can shake up things, if we can shake up the market, I think that people will find that containers are a better way to work, that they will find that Google understands containers very deeply, and that if you need a place to go run your containers, that you will consider that the Google Cloud is a good way to do it. But even if you don't, if I get the conversation changing from VMs to containers, Google wins, right? We win because it's easier to deal with the world, it's easier to hire people, the abstractions are the same. This is why I'm doing it, right? It, it's just, I just want to change the world, nothing major. Um, <clears throat>
So, I mean, we have a lot of experience here, but we didn't, notice we did not take what we had and just open source it. Um, we didn't think that open sourcing, you know, 200 million lines of C++ code would be particularly well received. Um, we didn't think that would build a community. We didn't think that that would be very flexible to sort of the very different um, worldview that people outside of Google have. There is Google, and we live in a bubble, and we acknowledge that we live in a bubble inside Google. What the world does is very different than what Google does. So we are listening to our users right now. We have, you, if you look at the history of Kubernetes, you can see a dozen places where we have made major design decisions that are very, very different than what we do inside Google. And the reason why they're different is because we're listening to what people are trying to do with Kubernetes. So this is a place where like you as the users, if this is something that's interesting to you, go check it out, take a look at it, see what doesn't make sense to you, and come talk to us. There's a very good chance that we're open to changing it. The big deal here now, workload portability. You should be able to write your job once and take it wherever you want, right? It shouldn't, you should not get locked into a cloud provider. You should not get stuck on Amazon or stuck on GCE. You should be able to write your job and take it wherever. Run it on-prem, run it in Google Cloud, split it half and half. These things all should work. Kubernetes is open. Great community. We have hundreds of contributors. Uh, our IRC channel is vibrant all day and into the night. Um, we are open to designs. We have, you know, we, we want to hear your ideas. Um, but most importantly, it's open source. So you can take it and you can do what you need with it. Here's some, some links for you to hit. Uh, I think I'm out of time. I think it may be over. Sorry. There's a workshop tomorrow at the Google Berkeley Developers Group. Yes? Yes. Google Berkeley Developers Group. Uh, if you're interested in going to the Kubernetes workshop, Brian right here, wearing the Google platform shirt, uh, will be happy to tell you more about it. Um, if you just want to ask questions, I'll be around. Half of the team is here, will be around. I have stickers. <laughs>